Hello and welcome to session five of the series, A Journey Through Acts, a guided tour through the Acts of the Apostles in six sessions. The focus this time is on chapter 15, verse 36, through to the end of chapter 19. That's chapter 15, verse 36, through to the end of chapter 19. We begin with a story of a falling out between friends and the last we see of Barnabas in the New Testament. If you've watched session four, you may already have read these chapters, but don't worry if you haven't, as I'll take us through step by step, giving you the references as we go. You can stop the video at those points and read the verses then if you so wish. It will also help to have a pen and paper at hand to jot down anything that might occur to you as we go. Chapter 15, verses 36 to 41. Sadly, at this point in Acts, we see a falling out between friends. Paul says to Barnabas that they should retrace the steps of their journey and see how those to whom they had earlier proclaimed the good news were doing. Barnabas wants to take John Mark uh, with them, but Paul disagrees. He feels that they were let down by Mark when he deserted them in Pamphylia. That was an incident recorded earlier in Acts, in chapter 13, verse 13. After considerable disagreement, Barnabas sails to Cyprus with Mark and Paul goes with Silas through Syria and Cilicia. Silas was one of the representatives of the Jerusalem Council. Out of conflict, the missionary journeys continued. Luke's account continues to follow the journeys of Paul and there are no more reports of the journeys of Barnabas. However, in some of Paul's late letters, it becomes clear that he holds Barnabas in high esteem and Mark eventually becomes a companion of Paul. Chapter 16, verses 1 to 5. Paul goes on to Lystra, where he is joined by Timothy, the son of a Jewish mother and Greek father. Timothy was well regarded by the believers in Lystra and Derbe. Paul, wanting Timothy to accompany him, had him circumcised. Why was Timothy circumcised? It seems a very harsh, de harsh decision and for Timothy a very painful one. We certainly know by this point in the development of the early Christian community that circumcision was not deemed necessary for salvation. It happened for the sake of the mission. Timothy was known to be the son of a Jewish mother but having a Greek father was problematic for some. Being circumcised made Timothy more acceptable to a Jewish audience. I must confess, I don't know how he would have known unless he was asked directly. As they went from town to town, Paul delivered the decisions made by the Jerusalem Council, not least about the inclusion of the Gentiles in the plan of God's salvation. This is the last reference in Acts to the Jerusalem Council. For the rest of the Acts of the Apostles, Paul becomes the authority. Chapter 16, verses 6 to 15. Paul's plans to return to places visited on his first journey is thwarted, when his way is blocked by the Holy Spirit. Paul ends up in Troas, where he receives a vision of a man of Macedonia pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul's missionary plan was not guided by human instinct alone, but also by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Paul and company set sail from Troas. The we passages of Acts begin here at verse 7, where Luke appears to include himself by saying we in the preparation of the journey. This could indicate that Luke is a first-hand witness and companion to Paul, or it may be that Luke is using another source that include we sections. It might also be a literary device, but many favour the eyewitness option. In verses 11 to 15, we read about the conversion of Lydia. What can be inferred about Lydia from the passage? I'll come back to that in a moment. Paul and company begin preaching at Philippi, a Roman colony and European city. It would be the setting of a later conflict between Paul and the Roman rulers. 
There in Philippi, Paul and company go to preach to the women by the river bank. Note this is a break in tradition. For the first time when preaching in a new place, Paul does not go first to the synagogue. There at the river they meet a woman named Lydia. She was from Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth, suggesting that she was wealthy and influential. The inference of the passage is that Lydia was a widow and the head of her household. Responding to Paul's message with an open heart, Lydia and all her household are baptised. Afterwards, at Lydia's invitation, Paul and his companions go to stay at her home, which then becomes a gathering place for the early converts at Philippi. Acts 16, verses 16 to 40. The next episode in the story comes when the disciples were on their way to the place of prayer. They find themselves followed by a slave girl who made much for her master by telling fortunes. She makes a nuisance of herself for several days by saying, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She was behaving as though possessed. Eventually Paul has had enough. He turns to the girl and says to the spirit that is tormenting her, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it does. I wonder what became of the slave girl. We are not told, though if she had lost her ability to tell fortunes, her owners would not have looked kindly on her. Angered by what had happened, the slave owners stir up the crowd with false accusations, and then on trumped up charges, the magistrates have Paul and Silas stripped and imprisoned with their feet fastened in the stocks. Far from being downhearted, Paul and Silas are singing and praising God when around midnight there is an earthquake. Miraculously, the prison doors are opened and the, pri and the prisoner's chains fell off. When the jailer who had been asleep woke up to find the prison doors open, he took out his sword to kill himself. He knew full well the penalty for allowing prisoners to escape. Paul, however, prevents him from doing this. The jailer receives the good news and he, along with his whole household, are baptised. They also wash the wounds of Paul and Silas and give them food. Whether the jailer then took them back to prison or kept them at his house is unclear. But either way, the jailer receives an instruction the next morning from the magistrates to release the prisoners. It seems the magistrates were unaware of the events that had taken place during the night. Then comes a twist. Paul chooses not to be released from prison, but to use his Roman citizenship to challenge the way he and Silas had been treated. Paul sends a message to the magistrates via the jailer to remind them of his status as a Roman citizen and the irregularity of what had happened. The magistrates become very concerned with this latest news, not least because they know a Roman citizen should never have been treated this way. So concerned, in fact, that they visit the prison themselves to offer their apologies to Paul and order their release, telling them to leave the city. The issue of Paul being a Roman citizen is highly significant, and we shall, as we shall see shortly. Paul and Silas go back to Lydia's house, where they encourage the believers before setting off again. Chapter 17, verses 1 to 15. At Thessalonica, Paul and Silas went to the synagogue where Paul argued with them on three consecutive Sabbaths, explaining that Jesus was the Messiah. Some were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as well as some Greeks and some leading women. Other Jews, however, were jealous and stirred up trouble. A mob formed and the city was soon in uproar. Unable to find Paul and Silas, the mob attacked the house of Jason, who had been a host to the disciples. He was beaten and arrested, though subsequently released. False accusa accusations were repeated by the mob that Paul and Silas had spoken against the emperor. What do you notice about the way Christianity was spreading? Despite continued persecution, Christianity was making ground, pushed out to break new ground, 
paradoxically by the ones who were seeking to wipe out the faith. Forced to leave Thessalonica, Paul and Silas make it to Berea, about 50 miles away. As usual, they preach first at the synagogue, where they are well received at first, with Jews and Greeks being converted. Soon, however, their opposition follows them from Thessalonica and stirs up trouble, their wrath directed mainly at Paul. The believers send Paul to the coast for his own safety, with Timothy and Silas remaining in Berea. When Paul arrives at Athens, he sends instruction back to Timothy and Silas to join him there as soon as they are able. Acts 17, 16 to 34. Waiting in Athens for his companions, Paul continues to preach, both to the Jews at the synagogue and also to the philosophers who take him to the Areopagus, the marketplace which was the hub of, de of debate. How successful do you think Paul's preaching was at the Areopagus? Paul makes connections with the context of what was taking place by talking directly to, uh, sorry, by talking directly about the unknown God to whom there was an altar bearing that inscription. Paul draws on scripture as well as nature and pagan poets to help connect with his audience. The listeners interrupt at various points, giving Paul the chance to respond and expand on what he was saying. He was cannily taking advantage of the openness of his audience and their willingness to debate and discuss. Overall, this episode of preaching was not hugely successful. On hearing about the res resurrection from the dead, some scoffed, and others said they would listen to him again in a fairly non-committal way. A few, however, did respond and become believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris and some others. It's interesting to note that even the great Paul sometimes had days when it was difficult to break through to people with the message he was proclaiming. Acts 18 verses 1 to 17. In Corinth, Paul meets up with Priscilla and Aquila. Exiled from Rome on the orders of Emperor Claudius, who ordered all Jews to leave Rome, they are mentioned several times in Paul's letters and become co-workers with Paul. They were tent makers and, Luke tells us, so too was Paul. His work meant that he was only free to preach at the synagogue on the Sabbath. When Silas and Timothy arrive from Macedonia, they find Paul busy preaching but meeting resistance. Silas and Timothy had brought with them funds from Macedonia to help support Paul's mission. There is another reference to this in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 9 where Paul expresses his gratitude. With the Jewish opposition increasing, Paul makes the decision to focus his work on the Gentiles. He goes to the house of Titius Justus, a worshipper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, a synagogue official, is converted along with many Corinthians. Assured of God's protection, Paul stays in Corinth for 18 months. We are told that when the region was under the rule of the proconsul Gallio, in 51 to 52 AD, Paul was brought before the tribunal. What accusation was made to the, pro to the proconsul Gallio about Paul? The trumped up charges against Paul this time were to do with his religious belief rather than anything against the emperor. For Gallio, this was of little or no concern. He would not be drawn over Jewish beliefs and he dis dismisses the accusers, telling them to sort it out themselves. The mob then seizes Sosthenes, the official of the synagogue, presumably for giving Paul an audience. They beat him in front of Gallio, and he leaves them to it. As we come to verse 18 of chapter 18, Paul's second missionary journey draws to a close. He leaves Corinth with, with Priscilla and Aquila as companions, sailing for Syria. Paul has his hair cut at Kensharia, possibly a release from a Nazarite vow taken ahead of the mission. They then travel to Ephesus before sailing to Caesarea and then overland to greet the church at Jerusalem. Next stop is Antioch, 
where Paul spent some time before travelling through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening the disciples of Jesus in the various towns. Acts 18 verses 24 to 28 As Paul's third missionary journey gets underway, the, sw the scene switches back briefly to Ephesus, where a Jewish convert named Apollos is preaching about the way. He is, however, lacking in understanding, knowing only about the baptism of John. So Aquila and Priscilla take him aside and teach him. Encouraged by the disciples at Ephesus, Apollos goes on to the region of Achaia, where he helps those who had become believers. Paul is mentioned, uh, sorry, Apollos is mentioned by Paul several times in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 4, chapter 4 verse 6 and chapter 16 verse 12 suggesting that Apollos became a significant disciple in those early days of the church. Acts 19 verses 1 to 10. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul arrives in Ephesus where he finds some disciples who, like Apollos, know only about John's baptism. Paul tells them about baptism in the name of the Lord, lays hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues and prophesy, giving witness to Jesus. Paul sent, spends some considerable time in Ephesus. At first he preaches in the synagogue for three months before being forced out by opposition to his message. He moves from there to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, where he preaches regularly over a period of two years. Luke says that all the inhabitants of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. No doubt this is an exaggeration, but clearly over two years many would have heard Paul speak. Acts 19 verses 11 to 20. Ephesus was a city steeped in magic, as this next section shows us. Why do people respond in the way they do when they know the sons of Sceva are sent packing? God was doing extraordinary things through Paul, with people being healed, even through handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched Paul's skin. Some itinerant Jewish exorcists then tried to use the name of Jesus without be believing in him to cast out evil spirits. Such exorcists would often seek to heal by using the name of any God credited with healing power. The attempt by the sons of Sceva to use Jesus' name in this way was disastrous. The evil spirit they were trying to exorcise overpowered them and they were forced to flee, naked and wounded. On seeing this, many people became believers in Jesus, confessed their occult practices and burnt their magic books publicly. This was a major decision for them. Not only were the books valuable in themselves, they were the way in which their owners earned their living. Chapter 19, verses 21 to 40. The final session of the chapter, which brings this session to an end, tells about a riot in Ephesus, resulting from Paul's ministry there. Paul was already planning his next steps, envisaging they would take him finally to Rome, but the riot forced his hand and made him leave Ephesus. Ephesus had a shrine to Artemis, a major fertility goddess of the Greek world. Pilgrims came to worship at the shrine and it was a great source of business for local artisans, among them silversmiths. Why did the silversmiths have a problem with Paul? Demetrius, a silversmith himself, was aware of the threat posed by Paul his preaching could turn away people from the worship of Artemis, thereby hitting their prophets. In fact, Paul's preaching could ruin them. So Demetrius gathers together opposition to Paul, probably due to his pocket rather than his devotion to Artemis. Enraged, they start chanting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, resulting in a huge commotion. Gaius and Aristarchus, companions of Paul, are dragged into the theatre 
but Paul is urged by his disciples to stay away. Alexander, a Jew, tries to distance Jews from Christians, but by now a riot is breaking out, until the town clerk is eventually able to silence the crowd. He warns that rioting could result in lack of freedoms, but that Demetrius could press charges if he wished. The crowd listens to the official and the riot ends. Paul would soon leave Ephesus. That brings us to the end of this fifth session. In the final session we will be considering chapters 20 through to the end of the book at chapter 28. Please read the chapters before watching the next session if you are able to do so. I hope this session has been helpful and I hope you can join me again for session six, the final session of the course. Thank you.